So hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, dear authors and invited guests. Welcome to the technical session three A. Myself Anshika Jain, and this session would be moderated by me. I, on the behalf of Global Knowledge Research Foundation and GR Scholastic LLP, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the eighth World Conference on Smart Trends in Systems Security and Sustainability World S Four. 2024 London UK the 8th edition of the conference is being organized in a hybrid mode the physical event was organized yesterday in London UK and the virtual event is being held through zoom from 25th to 26th july uh, anshita i'm sorry to interrupt but your voice is breaking okay uh am i audible yes we can hear you Okay. Yeah, you are audible, but the voice is breaking. Okay. So I hope you all will enjoy the knowledgeable and interactive sessions throughout the day. So in this session, we will have six presentations, and each presenter will be given twelve minutes for the presentation and three minutes for the questions and answers. On ten minutes, I will raise a gentle reminder. There is another request to all the participants that you stay connected with us till the closing remarks. If you have any query or any update, then you can write it to me in the chat box below. Just before we start with the session, I would like to introduce you to the chair for the session, Dr. Preeti Parvekar, Assistant Professor, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ghazabad, India. Dr. Preeti Parvekar is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and in Engineering, Faculty of Engineering and Technology. She has been an academician from the past twenty years. She holds a lifetime membership of IEEE, ACM, CSI, ISET. Her research interests include Internet of Things, cloud computing, machine learning, wireless source sensor networks, software engineering, information retrieval systems, social media, and data mining. Welcome to the session, ma'am. Would you like to share some quick opening remarks with us? Yeah, uh, thank you, Anshika, and thank you, the organizing team, for giving this opportunity to be a session chair. Uh, for this conference and all the best to all the authors who are going to present their work and research papers here uh, thank you thank you so much ma'am or uh, i would also like to introduce you to our next session chair dr thita pon genokritana lecturer king smong goods university of technology thonburi thailand she has received the bsc degree in media technology from the king mongoot university of technology thonburi bangkok thailand and a mechanical engineering degree in electrical engineering from gulong university bangkok her research interests include computer vision and machine learning especially human computer interaction for surveillance videos we are great to have you ma'am are you there Yes, thank you so much for your uh, introduction and uh, hello everyone. So um, it's my honor to serve as the co-session chair for this section. Yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. So now we would like to uh, start with the presentations. First up, we have Karen to present her paper titled "Co-innovations and deployments of smart low-cost phototherapy light system." Are you there, ma'am? Good afternoon, everybody. Hello from Manila. Uh, hello. So let me just yes. Uh, should I start? Begin. Yeah, you please may begin with your presentation, ma'am. All right. So I hope um you don't mind that I turn off my camera while I present, just um just to save on bandwidth. Oh, it's okay, ma'am. All right. One moment. So can everybody see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Your screen is visible. You may start now. All right. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Karen Oshones from the Ateneo de Manila University. And I am honored to present our paper on the co-innovations and deployments of the smart, low-cost phototherapy light system. So this initiative is a collaboration between the inter interdisciplinary team 
from the Ateneo Innovation Center, the Department of Science and Technology, and partner hospitals in Metro Manila and the provinces of Laguna and Binguet. So to start off, neonatal jaundice is a common condition that affects up to 60% of term and 80% of preterm infants globally. So it manifests as a yellowish discoloration of the skin and eyes, which causes, uh, which is caused by an excess of bilirubin in the blood. So when left untreated, these high levels of bilirubin can lead to severe complications such as brain damage. So ultimately, early detection and treatment is essential to prevent these out adverse outcomes. However, unfortunately, for many developing countries like the Philippines, the lack of resources and high cost of the treatment options hinder timely um, interventions. So neonatal jaundice um, is primarily treated by phototherapy. So it involves exposing the infant's skin to the blue light, which would help um, convert the bilirubin into a water-soluble form that can be easily excreted from the body. So while it is effective, um, traditional phototherapy units are expensive. So, and these um, are often inaccessible in resource um, limited settings. So this can cause a delay in the treatment, which can lead to serious health issues for the affected infants. So to address this, the Ateneo Innovation Center developed the smart, low-cost phototherapy light system. So it is an affordable LED-based phototherapy unit that uses locally sourced components. So it incorporates a smart monitoring system that includes non-invasive jaundice monitoring capabilities. It also has a built-in timer. It has ambient and temperature, uh, ambient temperature and humidity sensors, and an alerting feature. So let's look at closely at the system architecture. So the SLPLS uses LED pin lights, as you can see here. So with um a specific wavelength range in peak irradiance to provide effective phototherapy. So that meets the, the standard requirements. You know? So the unit is also mounted on a mobile stand, which allows for easy transport between different locations, whether in a clinical or in a home setting. So the stand's mobility also allows for convenient positioning of the system wherever it is required. So as mentioned, um, the unit features an advanced smart monitoring system that includes a built-in timer to track the treatment duration. Um, it also has the temperature and humidity sensors to monitor environmental conditions. And it also has an alerting feature to notify the healthcare providers um, of any issues. Like for example, if it's too hot or some other issues that may come up. So the modular design also allows for seamless integration with laptops or desktops. It can also be integrated into mobile phones or tablets. So this offers flexibility, um, which depends on the user's needs, of course. So this ensures that the infants receive um, consistent and effective treatment while minimizing the risk for errors. So additionally, the system is designed to be energy efficient. So it has the ability to operate on solar power, so which makes it ideal for use in areas with unreliable electricity supply. So this combination of features makes um, SLPLS a practical and sustainable solution for treating neonatal jaundice. So one of the advanced features of um, the SLPLS is its capability for skin yellowness quantification. So this feature uses computer vision technology to accurately assess the level of jaundice in infants by quantifying the yellowness of their skin. So the computer runs custom software to identify the skin regions present in an image using a modified version of COVAX rules for determining pixels as skin, after which the dominant colors are extracted using the k-means clustering. 
So the amount of yellow pigmentation is determined by the weighted average value of the normalized distance between a reference yellow point and the extracted colors blue-yellow chromaticity on this C-lab color space, so which are graphed to monitor um, the increase or the decrease of skin yellowness over time. So by monitoring the changes in color, the healthcare providers can make informed decisions about the duration and intensity of the phototherapy needed. So this non-invasive approach enhances the precision of jaundice management and ensures that infants receive the appropriate level of care. All right, so another critical feature of the SLPLS is its integrated safety mechanism with eye detection. So during phototherapy, infants typically wear eye patches to protect their eyes from the intense light. So however, there are times when these eye patches are dislodged. So the eye detection feature continuously monitors the infant's eyes and alerts caregivers if the eye patch is removed or is misaligned. So as you can see in the photo, when the eye patch is removed, the, the lights turn off for safety uh, purposes. So this helps uh, prevent potential eye damage and ensures that the infant remains safe throughout the treatment session. So when we compare it to commercial, sorry? Okay, so when compared to commercial phototherapy units, the SLPLS offers several distinct advantages. So the most notable is its cost effectiveness with the SLPLS being approximately four times less expensive than commercial units. So additionally, the SLPLS is designed to be more energy efficient, further reducing its operational costs. And then the integration of the monitoring systems and safety features also provides a higher level of care and convenience. So over the years, um, the low-cost photolight therapy system has evolved. And this um, was greatly due to the collaborations with several hospitals in Metro Manila and also other regions like Laguna and Benguet. So these partnerships have been instrumental in providing real-world feedback and testing opportunities. So for example, um, one of the feedback that we've received from healthcare providers is um, highlighting the importance of the eye detection features, so which was then incorporated into the system. So these collaborative efforts have ensured that um, the unit meets the practical needs of the healthcare providers and can also be integrated into various clinical settings. So to ensure um, its successful deployment, so the Ateneo Innovation Center conducted um, a series of extensive training sessions for medical staff, which would be include the nurses, the doctors, biomedical technicians, and also non-medical staff like the IT personnel. So these sessions covered the operation and functionality of the phototherapy unit, emphasizing the use of the monitoring system and safety features. So the feedback from these sessions um, have really helped shape um, the SLPLS from what it is today. So it we have received overwhelmingly positive um, feedback and um, healthcare providers have raised um, the ease of use and um, the, the convenience of the safety measures that it offers. So it has also uh, been a crucial factor in building confidence among medical staff and ensuring that the unit is used effectively. So the project has the potential to bring about several important outcomes through its innovative approach to neonatal jaundice treatment and monitoring. The first is the change in practices. So with the SLPLS offering a low-cost alternative to traditional phototherapy units, it challenges the reliance on expensive equipment in neonatal care. So the shift promotes broader adoption of cost-effective solutions. So its monitoring system of yellow pigmentation can supplement the doctor's assessments of jaundice prevalence of before, during, and after the treatment. 
So once it's correlated with bilirubin levels, it has the potential as a non-invasive alternative to invasive transcutaneous blood tests. So this can streamline and modernize diagnostics while enhancing comfort for infants and supporting informed treatment decisions by healthcare providers. So another is the behavior, skills, and attitude change. So medical practitioners and caregivers adapt their skills to effectively use the SLPLS and its smart system. So they, they learn to accurately interpret the yellowness score of the skin and understand the computer vision-based monitoring. So these um, embracing of technologically ad technological advances can lead to more advanced and patient-friendly healthcare practices. And then lastly is the accessibility to programs or services. So the SLPLS improves access to neonatal jaundice um, treatment by emphasizing low-cost materials and scalability. So this approach ensures treatment reaches underserved communities, aligning with the goal of providing quality health care to all, regardless of financial constraints. So its impact extends beyond immediate health benefits. Sorry to interrupt, so, ma'am, but you have two minutes to conclude your presentation. All right. So I am on my last two slides. Thank you for the reminder. All right, so the impact um, extends beyond immediate health benefits. So socially, it addresses critical healthcare needs in underserved communities. Um, economically, the affordable cost of the unit reduces the financial burden of health facilities and families. And academically, the project fosters further research and innovation in the field of neonatal care. So in conclusion, this, the smart low-cost phototherapy light system addre addresses a crucial need in neonatal care and supports global health in initiatives. So it aligns with our mission to use technology for social impact and contributes to Sustainable Development Goal 3, which is the goal, uh, good health well-being, particularly in reducing preventable deaths of newborns and achieving universal health coverage. So its successful deployment highlights the power of innovation and collaboration. So we plan to further enhance the system with a non-touch infant thermometer and improved AI software for better jaundice assessment, which would aim to, uh, to boost its effectiveness and convenience. So we are committed to ongoing innovation to make a significant impact on neonatal healthcare. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you so yeah, much. Do uh... you have any questions, Mom? Yeah, I I have just uh, one question. It's like very good work that you have taken up, and you have deployed it successfully. So it's very good for the public health care. I just want to know how have you checked the accuracy of the model, the testing and the accuracy. Sorry, come again. I I. Did how not have you that. checked the accuracy and testing of your work? I think it's for infant. All right. So, um, different um doctors have um cross checked it as well with um the standard um testing of um bilirubin levels in um the blood of infants. So, um, you can safely say that um whatever is um reflected in the yellowness score is um uh synonymous with um the bilirubin levels of in the blood. So yeah, that's how we cross-checked it. Ma'am, I guess your mic is mute. I said good luck for your future work and uh, in the future you can enhance it with the AI software. Thank you very much. And that, that's the only one question I have. If the other co-session chair wants to ask something. Yeah, I had a question about AI software. What was that referring to? What what kind of AI software would be used or what for? I guess so mom gave a suggestion. So uh, that's what uh, it is all about. So we'll move on to the next presentation. Next okay. Next, we have Dennis to present his paper titled Medical Diagnosis Algorithm. Okay, I so, can share a screen, right? Yeah, yeah, you may please start with the presentation. Okay, 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 I got it. All right, so 
Thank you very much. The, the title is a medical diagnosis algorithm. It is uh, work about a uh, software system that was developed uh, two decades ago. Uh, so we cannot uh, see your screen shared. You, you don't see it? No, no, no. Oh, that is intriguing. Uh, all right, all right, okay. Let me see what I can do now. You see it now? And no, sir. Oh. Okay, okay. Okay, share. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay. Yes, and now we can see your screen. All right, 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 right. Now you see that, but... Okay, yeah. Okay, so you see now the, the screen, right? This diagnosis algorithm, but it is not really to my liking. Well, it is really strange. Okay. Yes, so you may start. Okay, well, yeah, let's go. Let's see how it works. So this uh, this algorithm is um, is being used here for medical, but it is actually an abstract algorithm. Wherever you can find the equivalent of uh, diseases, symptoms, and system, what have you, you can use this algorithm as well. It is a uh, reply to what happens around 1980, where there is a, a Meissen system that was using expert system technology. And that was pretty hopeless because uh, extra system technology didn't work. And uh, the requirements for a good medical system would be that it is scalable, maintainable, trans transparency, and is testable. So that is uh, the, the next slide. And I will talk later on also about system development in the same way as it has been done in the previous uh, presentation. The requirement is scalable. It, uh, the system should be very easy to uh, extend uh, the, uh, the next uh, disease. That was a real problem in the, the Meissen system. It should be maintainable, easy to modify every knowledge item. There should be transparency, easy to inspect every knowledge, and it should be testable. So the trick will be, so that was being talked about also in the previous presentation. How, it can, how can you ascertain that it is okay. Now, let me see what I can switch. Ah, here we go. Here, there's an example of all the tools that are available in the system for editing, for maintaining it, what have you. And I think I should be able also to show something else. Here's, for example, a list of all diseases that are there. And here's the heart attack. And uh, I think here, here you have the heart attack. So here's, here, here can, you can see but the, but the internal is of the system. That is not what the user will see. It is more for how to maintain the system, how to build the system. And as you see, there are all here symptoms. There are all the features. Is it gender specific for this particular disease? It is not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the inside view. And here's a, a very intriguing disease that is syphilis, the fourth phase. Uh, you see in this list, there's no symptoms. And we'll come back to that later. Okay, now now I have to go back to uh, to this slide. Yes, okay. So the um, the I built this system two two decades ago, and at that time, object oriented thinking was already very important instead of functional thinking. And so it was you build a system these days first by looking at the data structures, and here's the ontology. Uh, the diseases over there, the symptoms are over there, abnormal condition over there. What are these kind of things? Well, a symptom is a thing that a user can 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 answer. Do you have a headache? Yes. Do you, are you fatigued? Yes. On the other hand, here are symptoms for which you need devices. You need a heart monitor or a, a ter thermometer in order to find it. What is a disease? A disease is, is a set of symptoms and a set of abnormal conditions together with potential locations and it is fine, but body is, is important. And that, that's about it. And the, uh, it, it, the ontology is extremely dense. A disease knows every symptom. Symptoms know what diseases they occur. Uh, it is unbelievably intric intricate uh, ontology. All right, now here's the uh, more details about this whole system. The number of symptoms, symptoms built in, the number of locations, and 
Ah, the number of diseases, five other diseases. And as I say, it is very easy to extend the system and look, look further into it and develop it further. All right, now the next slide is, this is very intriguing. That is part of the reason why this, how the system works. At a certain point, I was interested in asking the question, how do symptoms, um, uh, how, how are symptoms connected to these diseases? And it turns out that there are a tremendous amount of, of symptoms, 461 symptoms, that occur only in one disease. And the other, other, or the other end of the spectrum, there's nausea that occurs in 80 diseases, 85 diseases. So now go back and think about how do you do your diagnosis? Does it make sense in the beginning of the diagnosis process to use a symptom that is used only very, very sparsely? No, the best thing for, for the diagnosis process is, is ask for uh, the occurrence of symptoms that occur in many, many diseases because a yes, no answers will yield the, the most important, the, the, the most yield for, for, the, for the answer to the question of the, on the ranking and deciding what kind of disease is, is involved. Okay, now here are a few slides about how the algorithm works. Um, <clears throat> you start out, you need to know this algorithm what the age is of the person and what the gender is, because that has consequences over what diseases are relevant. So then the next thing is, given the fact that the algorithm knows this by now, then the at least, just like you go to a physician, the physician asks, why are you here? You have to provide the symptoms. So you have to provide it for symptoms. And obviously you will also say what kind of, what kind of body, body location is relevant. Then a doctor, a physician will have some ID right away and shall try to confirm whether the conjecture is indeed the case. The algorithm works fundamentally different. It considers all diseases associated with the current evidence, and that list is ordered according to the fraction of confirmed symptoms of the, of the disease. Then, um, once you have that, then then the um, you fetch the candidate new symptoms from candidate diseases, obtain a limited number of them that occur most frequently in the disease using the distribution that I just showed in the previous slide, present them to the user and ask for confirmation and rejection. Well, at that point, uh, you use the user's confirmed and rejected symptoms to re-rank the considered diseases and, and candidate diseases and candidate symptoms. Now, at that point, it could be the case that the system has already quite a good idea what it could be, uh, based upon the uh, that that the the number of confirmed symptoms is already pretty high for for a particular disease. It shows you a limited list of diseases when they have high confirmation. You get a differential diagnosis. You get the whole diagnosis of a single thing. No, you get the diagnosis of a list of diseases that are potentially relevant, and they're ordered according to uh, to their relevance. And that uh, and that and the, the your user can then decide that this is it and, and, and terminate the session because okay that, that 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 particular disease that is that is found is likely the case. If, that, if the user doesn't confirm it, then you go back to the previous step. And the, this process stops with the most likely, um, the most likely disease. Now, the question is, can you prove this algorithm correct? Well, correct is proof for this system is not, problem, not possible, but you can validate, you can validate, you can use a patient simulator. You select the disease, select the first symptoms, and then you do what, what a patient would do, generate kind of the symptom for the user, confirm the system, and it shows the disease, repeat until finished. And when you're finished, check that the selected disease is indeed found. And the good news is that, uh, yes, all, all the diseases that, uh, that are in the system has been confirmed correct, in the, except one, and that is the one that you have over here, that is this, oh no, that was the, the other one, that is the, the syphilis. The syphilis is in, has different phases. And in the first phase, uh, in the fourth phase, there is no symptom, so you cannot validate that one. But everything else is, can be validated. All right, so the next one, how do you deploy this system? Well, there are different modes of operation. 
a user can simply step up and go to go to to the to the site and it can log in or not, not log in that's that this one user will give more details about it and a physician can can, can create an account and and and, if, and, if, and the patient can then use it as he fits and the third mode is call center support all right here are the details um you simply any user can go to can go to the can can go to this website and can doesn't even have to create an account and could, can do a session and learn what what the what the situation is. It can also create an account and then every session is being added to an electronic record. An other version is that a physician creates an account, the user does a session, and the physician sees the result and can then contact the uh, can contact the, the, the patient what to do or not to do. The Cadillac version of the system uses a call center with physicians uh, with with physician. A user logs in uh, and does a session. This call center, the people in the call center look over the shoulder of the user. They see what kind of symptoms there have been selected. They see what kind of diseases are conjectured by the system. And if necessary, they see life-threatening life diseases, they can start a chat session with the user and, and uh, give recommendations. Okay, keep this, my, give, give the, keep this system in mind. Then, um, yeah, that is, <clears throat> this is a system whereby that can be used in, in areas of the planet where there are no, no physicians. Sorry no, to interrupt you, sir, but you have sorry, to... What? Sorry to interrupt you, sir. You have two minutes to conclude your presentation. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So this is a fantastic uh, version that I can really recommend in Africa and in other areas. Um, okay. Uh, is it possible to use another language? Yes. Is this is this system still relevant? Well, there are these days a lot of um, other ways to do a diagnosis. Um, there are also uh, other maneuvers these days in medicine. There is, there is defensive medicine and that decreases the relevance of symptom-driven diagnosis. Um, I've compared this system against Google search and chat systems. This system cannot do the, the interaction that I just described. My assessment for this system is that AI machine medical data does not meet human existential needs in one-on-one -on -one session, but it, it does all work for this Africa version. And for an expert that uh, is not familiar with, of, if, or an expert of, that is not uh, familiar with an obscure disease, you can use this kind of system. Your questions, your turn. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Ma'am, do you have any questions? Both the... Sorry, what? Uh, no, uh, Dennis, it's a very uh, good work. Uh, but have you implemented this? Uh... Yeah, this, this system is working already for two decades. Them. It works for two decades already. But the only thing what I'm saying is okay. that if you are, if, it, if, you, if you are actually a, a patient and you need help, then this this one on one session with the system I, is not viable. I, I tested it out, and, and people are scared of it. But but I, again, I say the, the the Africa version where the where a, a patient using an assistant, and the assistant then talks with with the Cadillac version, that provides the information that you can that can be conveyed to the the patient that 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 is talking with the assistant. And then the advice can be, well, you better take a helicopter to the nearest hospital because there's a problem. Or you get the advice, don't worry, everything is okay. All right. All right? Yeah. Okay, well, thank, thank you very you. much. It is uh, two o'clock in the morning here, so I go to bed pretty soon. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's really okay. nice. Thank you. Okay. Can Hi. I make a comment? Yeah, so... Sure, okay, now, now you, you. Hi, Dennis. Hi. Yeah, you said uh, it's implemented already. Oh yeah, the, the system works already for, for two decades. 
Uh, so if you if you want to if you want to try it out, um, just contact me, and I will send you okay. the link. I sent you the, the the website that you can do, and the system is. I can tell you, this system is working for two decades and never crashed. It's a very okay. very very solid. System. I've worked on this for five years. Okay, now why? Because you did not show us how it was implemented, and then you are showing us the algorithms up to five. One should have expected more details about use case situations sequence diagrams but i'm i'm talking particularly about the use case situation because you were telling us how it could be deployed that right how do you who who initiates who are the actors how it's initiated and then uh, showing the various stages that would have helped to understand the details of the designs involved yeah, as I said, as I said at the beginning, it's an object-oriented architecture. And yeah, uh, that's why I'm mentioning all this. That's what? Because if you if you have if you have uh, a clear use case situation where you have uh, the, the 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 first part usually is the use cases where we have to know the the the, the name, the actor, the description. What right. triggers an event? What is the trigger? For example, if you want to book, make an appointment, or to go no, and no, see no, your no, physician. No, 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 no. It is not that kind. Of, it is equivalent of having a visit to a physician. Okay, so having a visit to a physician, then all those should have also been shown on the first part of the use case. The next part is where you now show us how. If there is a visit, the actions that are performed and so on and so forth, and 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 so on. And I'm just saying this because it's you are describing the system here. We didn't see the actual implementation and so on and so forth. But these other details would have helped, right. particularly if there is a use case presented. One would have seen more details than what you have presented. Apart but, from know, the algorithms. Do you realize you can you can simply I give you the URL of the system and you can go okay, there. You can leave it, you can leave it, you can leave your, your contact on. I'm just making a comment so that students are here, Peras Venture. There are research students, people who want to learn from your experience and right, so on right. and so forth. What right, ought right, to right, have right, been right. done? You yeah. just contact me and I and I will give you more details and you can and actually, of course, I'm very intrigued to find locations where they can actually use the system. But because I'm living here in California, and people simply have so much medical facilities, they don't have to use yeah. a system like mine. Okay, uh, you can leave, leave. You can leave your details on the on the chat box, and uh, because I, oh, I connected late, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, was... But don't you have access to the proceedings? Uh, yes, so you have the access to the chat box. You can write. I have no idea where that is. Hmm. Okay, um, okay. You just leave it when you find it, or if it's on the presentation, we'll try to to look at it. I, I see right now a, a shared. Yes, you have to share maybe. Okay. You just have to write in the chat box. Sir. So we'll be starting with the next presentation. Next, we have Parakam to present his paper titled Navigating the Metaverse, a study on cybersecurity implications. Are you there, sir? Are you there, sir? So we will be moving forward to the next presentation. Next, we have Joseph to present his paper titled Operationalizing Information Systems Resilience Within the Financial Services Sector. Are you there, sir? I am. Can okay. you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, sir. You may start with your presentation. Okay. Thank you very much and um, thanks for having me. I'm um, actually zooming in from Johannesburg. I know everybody says the time. So it is almost 11 o'clock in the morning here and it's a nice 20 degrees centigrade. The skies are blue and it is, I think it's quite lovely. 
So firstly, welcome. And what I'm going to talk to you guys today about is resilience in banking. And um, let me share my screen with you before we start with that. Um, just hang on. Window capture. Uh, there we go. Can you guys see that? It says overview of resilience. Yes, so we can see see your screen. You may start now. Okay. So let's look at a typical use case. You go shopping in Milan from your typical bank in America and you whip out your credit card from America and you pull it through a system or a point of sale unit there in Milan and it goes through, uh, that whole transaction goes through a card acquiring system in Italy. It gets sent over um, networks, everything back to the States. It check if you have money in your bank account. It actually deduct the money from your bank account. It does fraud detection. It goes back and you can buy your latte or your um, cappuccino in Milan or your shoes or whatever you want to buy. And it's actually amazing if you think about the whole payment system of banks and actually how it works and how it's actually integrated across the world. I think what people do not really understand is how complex these systems are. For example, any large bank would have around 1,200 to 1,800 systems running in the background to facilitate all of these transactions. And the interesting thing about this is not all of these systems are residing in your own organization. They're sitting in country infrastructure, trading houses, clearing houses, and um, with other banks. And I think that is the problem I want to sketch to you today. What if things go wrong? What are the tools and techniques people use to actually manage large complex systems like this? So um, let me just go to the second slide. So what you will see here is a slide that was presented to the largest bank in um, Africa to their board on what resilience is and how to keep their systems up. Because this bank went through a quite a patchy period where once a month, some of their systems went down and had an hour or two um, outage. Or on the last day of the month when it is payday, the system load is so high that some of the applications actually struggle. And this was presented to their board. So this is exactly a slide from their board. What firstly states what resilience is and what capabilities they need. And basically what was presented to this company board is that the biggest source of failure in this big bank was configuration drift. And what that means is the systems that have been running in production from the 1970s or the 1980s. And there's code running in production systems, there's code running on testing systems, there's code running on intermediate servers, there's code running on the laptops of the different developers who's trying to keep all of this in place. And this has been going on for decades. And over time, the system configuration, call it the operating system, the database configuration, the web services, all of these things are slowly starting to drift apart. Config systems are in place but it is very hard to keep these things updated. So the first thing this bank identified was configuration drift is a huge problem. The second thing is poor observability. In classical academic literature, we talk about uh, monitoring, and um, the new word for this is observability, where you don't only look at the system and component failure, you look at the whole business transaction. And keep in mind, again, the use case we've had of buying a coffee in Milan and how many systems and things are in place. And almost everybody has lots of monitoring in place, but very few people actually have observability in place where they look at the business process across all of these different systems and different banks. And then system teams, that is a contribution from the agile methodology, is when you have, let's say that payment example, you have many people from many different teams actually trying to keep the systems up and also to provide new um, features on it. But what you need is sometimes you need teams that run above these teams that understand how all of this fits together. And those things are called in um, agile parlance um, system teams. And where a lot of people have focused in the past just on getting product teams in place, 
you actually need to look at these system or ecosystem teams. So that was presented to the board and they said, this is our problem. And then they said, we need X billion of dollars, et cetera, to fix this problem. And what they basically said is, we need to do the following things to fix it. And um, just to come back to the academic side of this um, talk is, this is a qualitative study to see what are the practices that's in place for system reliability or a more old fashioned word is service management in IT systems or especially financial systems. And the other thing I want you to keep in mind here is if some of you are aware of what's happening in service management, see of how many things you see on this slide. See how many of those are actually part of the large methodologies like ITIL or COVID or something like that. And I think the point we want to make is that there's a big difference in what is important to industry and what methods they are following for system reliability and system resilience versus what are being researched. So the first one is infrastructure as code. And what it's meant by that is everything, even if it's a server, even if it's a database or operating system, even if it's actually constructing the virtual machine, needs to be done with code and that code needs to be under version control. So basically where you had system administrators actually creating machines or virtual machines um, by hand or by using a couple of scripts, all of those things need to be fully automated and it needs to be as code. With um, cloud and all of that, where most big banks are moving to, infrastructure as code is becoming a non-negotiable. The other one is observability, which we spoke about. And it is just to have these end-to-end -end business process modeling in place or monitoring in place, supported by thousands of monitors on system processes and um, monitoring of infrastructure. Then blast radius is a concept where basically um, if a system goes down, it should not infect all of the systems around it. So basically, for example, if you have an app on your phone and the payment side of it goes down, you can at least still access your investments, etc. It's not as if the whole app um, falls down. And to do that, there's many software design principles like um, um, load breakers, etc. that needs to be in place to manage those things. The next thing which they needed investment for was pipelines, and that is deployment pipelines where the code from the developer's laptop to where it's deployed in the cloud or server somewhere is fully automated. So there's no fingers in between in terms of um, testing or deployment or everything. All of those processes is automated. Pipelines go hand in hand with infrastructure as code. Incident management, that's a typical um, idle um, competency is when the system goes down, you need to have teams in place, et cetera, what, to actually manage the outage. And I think what came about in the last five to seven years in financial services, incident management um, were really well done, but how to do it across teams is actually starting to become very hard. Communication also is something that was not focused on in the past, where you actually need to have processes in place so that if a system goes down, you actually notify your clients. And a lot of these things were done by IT de department in the past, but now a system goes down and you want to tell your, um, you want to be able to tell your customers the system is down, this is when it will be up, those type of things. And normally banks are very cagey about what's happening and every now and then they just give a public update. But what we're finding is that the public are actually wants info as much as possible. HADR, High Availability Disaster Recovery, also classical ITIL type um, construct, is you need to have high available systems and you need to also have disaster recovery in place. What happens over time is with these systems that's so complex and across so many industries, it is very hard to do, to do DR. And to take the time off to do a good DR test, you actually need to stop development. And very few people actually have the appetite to stop money making features going into an app to actually just to do DR. Systems teams, we spoke about a little bit. And all of that um, is meant by that is you need teams 
looking after many other teams who understand what they're doing, who is not just in the product, but in the ecosystem of the product. And then the last but not least, also contribution from Agile is retrospectives, where you actually run these processes post-fact, where you see what happened and why it happened. And I think Agile's big contribution was blameless um, post-mortems, where you can't get fired or anything for actually um, raising what went wrong. A good example of this is um, a network engineer made a small change on the network and actually brought the whole network down. A new CIO decided this is unacceptable and they fired the individual. These are key man dependencies. The person got fired and two months later, there was a network outage again. None of the network engineers owned up who made any change or whatever because they were too scared for their jobs. And it makes it really hard to do proper retrospectives if it is a blame finding session or finding a um, scapegoat or finding a culprit. So most of the modern retrospectives are blameless and it's trying to find out what happened because you want people to own up to what has happened. So that is bank A and that is what they did. This is the largest bank, um, one of the largest banks in Africa. This is the third largest bank in Africa. And they also had um, resilience issues. And you won't see these things a lot in public because banks don't really want to share what's happening around their system uptimes and resilience. What you will see here uh, is um, far more idle. And you will see that this was also presented to their board and they also wanted funding of um, hundreds of millions of um, dollars to actually put all of this in place. So you will see subtle differences, monitoring, Big, where the one bank called it observability, these guys still do monitoring. Backup is important, high availability. If you um, can remember, we spoke in the previous one about HADR, those are those two, unsupported systems. When you have a 1,200 systems, of which some were still implemented in the 70s, yes, Hello. they yes, just, sorry. yeah, I'll finish. Yes, sorry? Sorry to interrupt you, sir, but you have two minutes to conclude your presentation. Yes. Thank you. So these uninterrupted, uh, unsupported systems, these things have been in production for many years um, and nobody looks after them because they just run. They just pass information from one system to another. And you can read there, there's disaster recovery, capacity management, single points of failures, strategic fit. Some systems doesn't even fit the strategy of the company anymore, but it's just too expensive to actually decommission them. Some systems don't even have documentation anymore and then vulnerability management, which is mostly security. So all we wanted to say in this paper is where we normally teach and a lot of research, if you go look at it, is in um, COBIT and ITIL and um, service management. What we see in industry is actually our agile techniques, DevOps techniques, Site reliability engineering and still ITIL are being used. What we don't see as research is actually how people actually use these methodologies in practice. In the past, we just rolled out ITIL. Now there's all of these other things. For those interested, site reliability engineering is basically what Google and Facebook and all of the Silicon Valley companies use to do their systems engineering. They won't touch ITIL, but we'd still teach ITIL. So, where is the research on this? And um, Madam Chair, thank you. I just wanted to show what's happening in industry, what we are researching and show what the gap is. Thank you very much. Yeah, Joseph, thank you. Thank can you, you hear me? Yes, uh, I can hear you crystal clear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, have you used Agile model or you're planning to use it? Yes, we've used Agile at scale many times, and most of the big banks use it that in their development. But again, how Agile informs system reliability and how it informs um, more the production side of organization. There's always development and um, support. DevOps try to bring it together. Agile tries it to, be, to bring it together. And um, almost all of the big banks have done that in development. We have not really seen that come to the fore in the production side of things. So very good question. Thank you very much. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Mom, do you have any questions? Okay.
So we'll proceed towards the next presentation. Next thank up. You, yeah, thank you. Next up, we have Paragam to present his paper titled Navigating the Metaverse, a study on cybersecurity implications. Are you there, sir? Are you there, sir? So we will be moving on to the next presentation. Next up, we have Salivia to present her paper titled Transforming Training with New Enabling Technologies, a proposal to verify the efficacy of virtual reality tools in the Hello. occupation, health and safety setting. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, you may start with the presentation, ma'am. Yes, I can present now. One sec. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yes, we can see your screen, ma'am. You may start now. Yes. Yeah, I just want to. Okay. All right. You should see now the presentation in a white screen, right? Yeah, we do. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Silvia Colabianchi, and today I'm presenting. Um, um, our work titled Transforming Training with New Enabling Technologies, a proposal to verify the efficacy of virtual reality tools in the occupational health and safety sector, uh, which is authored by Michael Diggs in an interdisciplinary project on resilience principles within also occupational health and safety. Um, our, research, uh, our research project uh, poses its challenges within the occupational health and safety sector. And since new digital technologies are introducing new risk and also unusual and unpredictable situations that arise from the interaction between humans that today have to work with machines, new technologies and the environment. So in this perspective, um, what comes out is that trainings becomes even more essential than before and training uh, with traditional classes, frontal lessons um, has become insufficient. So um, also uh, talking with uh, companies, what we found out is that trainees indeed required to be trained in a more immersive and experiential uh, training environment to, to develop skills to, to face uh, also unpredictable scenarios. So to go um, out of the uh, of the traditional training, which is more focused on uh, rules and procedures, and also give them the ex experiential of the um, experiential side in the in the training. So in this context, um, is introduced this project and and this research, which is a first step in this uh, in this direction. Um, for this study, we have defined two research questions with the, which have been uh, defined for um, for the work. The first one uh, aims at uh, identifying which training tools can uh, assist organizations that are undergoing digital transformation, uh, while the second one poses its attention on the content that should be included in the training because we believe that it's not only on the tools of the trainings that have to change and adapt to these new scenarios but also on the content that we want to um, put inside the, the training. Um, so uh, for this uh, for this study which is a first step in, in a bigger project that we are conducting in with our interdisciplinary team um, we are a team of 12 experts we have different backgrounds. Uh, so we have some people going from the psychological and uh, pedagogical side of the of the research. And also we have some um, technicians and uh, engineers specific on immersive technologies. And also a group of people um, involved in uh, with an industrial background. So where we want to test the, the solution. Um, the team has met and defined a study protocol for our VR 
uh, virtual reality based um, occupational safety and health and safety training solution. And the, the study protocol can be uh, divided into three um, macro steps. The first step is the one where the, the team has to focus and uh, define the training tools and the contents they want to introduce in the training. Second step is the um, definition of the application and all the scenarios and the, the testing procedures. And the final step is the uh, evaluation process. So both metrics and interviews and all those kind of um, evaluation techniques that everyone wants to that one wants to introduce in their training uh, solution. So going a little bit deeper in uh, into the the steps and also proposing some of the first uh, results of the of the project in step one we had to um, define the training tools and contents. So first of all, we uh, opted for the use of a virtual reality technology and virtual tool models, which have been um, defined because they were good in um, meeting on the job training needs. So we could uh, represent a, a current scenario that operators were facing in the industry and reproduce it into a virtual reality um, environment. Then we had to, to use, we de decided to use a storytelling approach. So we don't want to do a training which is task specific, but we want to, to build a story that the operator has to uh, leave inside the training, the, the war solution. Um, so inside this, uh, this story, we have described each possible scenarios and situations that the operators can, uh, can face. Um, we have chosen uh, Vuel also because um, this technology allows learners to actively engage with um, the tools, the machinery, the technologies, and we can also introduce avatars representing other operators or their supervisor, which they can that, that they can find in today's um, uh, work environment. And also, uh, all of this uh, is uh, the user can leave all this in a six uh, degrees of freedom learning environment, which gives them um, a full um, experience of the uh, of the solution. Um, then we we move to the uh, step two, which is the definition of the application context. Um, we had to define um, in, in which in which context we want to build our first uh, story. So we um, decided also uh, talking with um, uh, the the companies where we are we are working with. It we opted for maintenance procedures. Uh, specifically, we have decided to focus on lockout tagout procedures because, according to the to the most recent data, both European data and American data, um, they are still a big issue for uh, operators in the industrial context. It's among the um, the ten um, most uh, fatal um, cause of uh, accident into industrial environment. So we are focused on these uh, procedures and, um, and we define also a specific maintenance activities uh, where we decided to, uh, to build our, our application. Um, specifically, lockout tagout procedures are those kind of procedures um, that an operator has to follow to begin and to, to, to do a maintenance of an industrial uh, element. So the, these procedures have six main phases. First of all, we have to prepare the machine shutdown. Then um, we have to shut down the machine. Uh, and then we have to do a lot of checks following uh, specific rules. So first of all, we have to check if the all the energy source have been isolated. And then every time we check the energy source isol isolation or um, specific uh, part of the machines, we have to ap apply locking devices on ta or tags. So what usually happens is that operators, because they have multiple things to do, uh, they have also multiple tasks to accomplish, they are uh, in a hurry, they have a lot of tasks. So what they do is that they don't put all the locking devices, all the tags, they don't follow all these kind of steps. So these are usually 
some of the problems that then brings to uh, a fatal issue. Um, then they have to uh, check if there is some residual energy dissipation, which is also another cause of accident, and then uh, isolation verification. So for our case study, we follow a lot of procedures specific for an industrial compre compressor because we have data on this case study right now, um, which is quite a complex procedure because it involves uh, three energy sources, uh, multiple others such as electric shocks, uh, rotating machines, compressor. So it was quite a, a complete um, uh, scenario. Um, then once we um, have uh, defined all the, the, the storytelling, we, uh, we move to defining the, the scenarios. Um, to define these scenarios, we also wanted to, um, to build the scenarios on a um, theoretical framework. So we opted for um, a well-known framework, which is uh, called Ski Rule Knowledge Framework. And which joins um, training and human factor principles. This framework um, defines three levels of training and comprehension. So first, the first level is the skill-based level. Uh, it's also known as the do level, where um, automatic responses are generated by humans based on their personal experience. So if you touch something that is hot, you feel that that source is its source. So, so this is the first the first level, something that uh, we we all uh, we all know. Then there is the rule based level, which is the first level that we can teach, and and it's based on a if then reasoning. So we teach rules and procedures. But then what's happening now? It's that we cannot stop at this level. We have to move forward to the third level, which is the knowledge based level, which is based on um, on a think principle. So. We want to teach people to uh, start problem solving and decision making. And so we want them to mix more rules and procedures and be able to uh, adapt those uh, rules and procedures to what is happening. Um, so merging their skills and they and, and the... Sorry and to interrupt you, ma'am, but you have two minutes to conclude your presentation. Okay. And then we also um, define the... Uh, the, the procedure for the, the testing. So we divided the people into groups, group A and group B. Um, in group A, we uh, decided to, to follow a classic training, a lecture-based training, while group B uh, moved to an immersive work training so that we could uh, also test uh, um, these two solutions. And then for the evaluation, we decided to both to test the knowledge with a classic traditional test and then also we wanted to test the experience using multiple questionnaires, such as the simulator signal questionnaire, the present questionnaire, and the NASA task load index to test the, um, the experience and the usability uh, of, the, of this training system. So to conclude, um, we actually believe that it's important to uh, incorporate practical exercise that can simulate real life situation and encourage the development of training and, and for uh, unforeseen circumstances. So go, um, so do not teach only procedures, but also to teach to um, to to deal with uh, unpredictable situations. Future step uh, of this project, of course, uh, is to fully develop this solution and complete all the tests and validate it in a laboratory environment and also in an industrial environment and also extend the scenarios to include the, the training for supervisors. Um, and finally, also refine where training models to add also some uh, other procedures. So thank you for your attention. I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, do you have any questions? No questions from my side. Uh, ma'am, do you have any questions? I have no questions, thank you. So I guess then we will be moving on to the next presentation. Next up, we have Kutsu to present his paper titled, What data are your smart home device collecting? Are you there, sir? Um, yes, I am here. Yeah, you may start with the presentation, sir. No problem.
Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen, so. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, from wherever you're watching in the world. I don't know if I'm sharing my video, just give me a second. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from, from wherever you're watching. Um, across the world. So my name is Kujo Levea and um, my paper is titled, What Data Are Your Smart Home Devices Collecting? So the agenda, um, the presentation is gonna follow the following agenda. I'm gonna start by an introduction where I'll um, explain the um, idea behind the paper and where it falls in, and then the problem domain, then the problem, then the solution that we are working towards, and then the future work within the study. So as mentioned, my name is Kujo Lebea from the University of Johannesburg. I'm currently pursuing my PhD in computer sciences, and um, the paper that I'm going to be presenting today makes part of my PhD studies under the supervision of Prof. Um, YZ Lung. Um, so if we look at the problem domain, so pretty much what I am, the idea is we were looking at what data is um, smart homes or what data are IoT devices collecting in um, total. Um, so to figure out what this data is being used for and how service providers actually um, get a hold of and use this information. So in order to tether the study in one way or another, we decided to focus on smart homes as the environment in which we're going to be looking at the data collection and the data use. So typically, by definition, a smart home is a home equipped with appliances that can be controlled remotely using a device connected to the internet. And the mere fact that these devices are connected to the internet means in most cases, the um, data that is being collected by these devices is then in the control of the service provider. So some of the... Um, some of the things that make up a smart home would be a smart home hub, um, the fact that it's connected and um, smart speakers, a smart security system, smart thermostat, smart lighting, smart sensing, smart cameras, smart doorbells, smart appliances, um, entertainment systems, smart blinds and curtains, and smart plugs and outlets. So in isolation, if we look at these devices in isolation, the information that they typically gather may not be all that intrusive. But if we had to put together an entire smart home together, the information that is gathered and aggregated from all of those different devices can um, show certain traits of the smart home dwellers and maybe certain behaviors that they may not want to um, be shared with others. And in most cases, they may not, may not even be aware of some of the um, habits that are picked up by these smart devices. So speaking about the problem is once again, the problem is a lot of data is being collected by all of these devices, um, be it in a smart home environment or outside of a smart home environment. And um, the sources of personal data is usually separated into, into three different categories, which is the observed data, voluntary um, personal data, and inferred in inferred personal data. So if we start with the voluntary um, or the volunteer data, this makes part of um, all of the surveys that we answer on a daily basis or the information we give out when we're creating accounts for these smart home um, systems. So that is information that we are aware of that we're giving away and usually does not need to be um, protected. So the observed personal data is when um, the sensing that happens inside your house from your smart home, um, your smart speakers, your smart thermostat and all of that, they will be observing certain things um, about you and then that information can then be relayed over to those uh, third parties and service providers. So things like your location, sensing and the things that you have on um, connected devices. Then the last one and the most dangerous in my opinion is the inferred personal data where an aggregation of the volunteered personal data and the observed 
um, personal data then gets used to make inferences on your life. And these can be things like um, used to exclude you from certain um, opportunities or to uh, um, have certain things like um, discrimination based on um, certain criteria or this information can be used as a form of identity theft. So when we start talking about what is uh, personal data, so personal data is basically any data that belongs to you. And because um, security is a sliding scale in terms of wh what I may consider to be not be secure might be something that you consider to be secure. So it's a sliding scale, but um, the legislation such as the GDPR have then outlined a differences, the differences between sensitive personal data and non-sensitive personal data. Um, the differences between these two categories of personal data is the level of um, protection that these um, pieces of information need or should be afforded. So sensitive personal data um, falls under the categories are things like uh, beliefs, philosophical or religious beliefs, ethnic, um, ethnic or origin or race, trade union memberships, political affiliation, health, sex life, or biometric information, and alleged um, commission of any offense or proceedings concerning any offense allegedly con um, committed and the outcomes of such proceedings. So these, this is information that is highly protected by the GDPR. And as mentioned from a discriminatory point of view, things like your health, sex life, and or biometric information can be used to exclude you from opportunities such as jobs or get you a higher um, medical aid or health insurance. And all of this information is being collected in the background, usually without the no knowledge of the um, data owner and it's being used against that data owner. So in terms of if we had a situation where people were aware of the information that's being collected, then they would be um, in a position to rectify if that information is incorrect. So worst case scenario is some of this information is erroneously collected and then decisions are made based on those erroneous, um, it, based on the erroneous data. So um, what is the personal data then used for when all of these devices are collecting the information that we um, that they they are capable of sensing? First and foremost is for advertising purposes. So in order for them to advertise information, in order for them to advertise new products your way, um, I remember about three years ago, Google were asked if they give out any of the information and they said no, but they do have a third party company that does uh, RoboVac, if I'm not mistaken. So what RoboVac then does is whenever, or did at the time, is whenever that um, robot vacuum would go around your house, house and um, uh, vacuum your house, it would keep track of how big your spaces are. And that information would be relayed over to companies like Google and Amazon so that they can then target um, ads your way. So for argument's sake, if you had a blank room um, that you then said was your lounge and there wasn't a couch or something along those lines, then ad ads for certain products would then be um, sent your way. So user profiling is mentioned from a macro and a micro profiling point of view. So from a macro pro pro profiling point of view would be to put you in a category based on um, certain things like your health, your risk factors and all of that. But your micro profiling would be um, specific to you and the things that you do that again, the information might not be might not be um, collected with your consent. So data sales where data brokers are selling our information in South Africa. Currently, we do have a large, um, a huge problem with uh, uh, telemarketers who constantly, besides there being legislation against this, will still um, call you unsolicitedly. And then potential government spying, um, that is p possible where governments are buying this data from those data brokers or directly from these um, uh, first party merchants. So for argument's sake, uh, Ring, which is a Google, um, partner company allows the US um, police service access to 
their um, ring cameras in case it will be used if it's needed to be used in a crime investigation. So that is one of the things that you may not be aware of that your information can be and will be used in a investigation with or without your consent. And the final and the most prevalent one is product production and system training. So with more and more of these smart devices, because they need to be smart in one way or another, and the definition of smart in this case would be if they can make decisions almost intelligibly to um, figure out what time you're coming back from work, how you like your water um, in terms of the temperature or um, how you like the heat in your house. So being able to make these decisions without human intervention needs a lot of training. So a lot of training data is needed for all of the um, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms that most of these products Use. So this is typically what the information is used for on um, the information collected by the smart devices. And as mentioned before, from a legal point of view, there is uh, the EU has the general data Did protection regulation. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but so, but you have two minutes to conclude your presentation. Not a problem. Um, the US has the California consumer privacy laws. Australia has the Australian privacy principles and um, a whole lot more from the South African point of view. We have the personal um, information, I mean, Protection of Personal Information Act. So there is something that's being done from a legal point of view, but the uh, legality of it only goes so far. As um, Prof Langerman mentioned earlier, it's uh, situations where some of the people don't want to disclose what is happening in these um, companies because of the fear of being um, fired. So in most cases, most of the companies find themselves in a state of non-compliance to these league um, to these legislations. So, as a solution to this, what I've come up what I've come up with as the main contributor to my uh, PhD is a framework that is going to be used to allow the data holder to keep control of all their data. So, in this diagram over here, we've got service number of service providers that have a number of devices. All of these devices are going to then collect the information. The information will not then be sent to the service provider, but will be sent to something called a personal data store. So all of the devices will store their data in a database that is um, in the control of the data owner, and there will be an interface between the data and the service provider. So each and every data owner is going to be allowed to decide what data they're comfortable sharing with service providers. And whenever they de-associate with that service provider, the link will be um, severed. It is a, a uh, um, three-tier level where on the top tier, you would, be, you would have people who don't wanna share anything whatsoever. They would be able to get into some sort of smart contract, contract with the service provider and possibly um, pay for certain services instead of having their uh, personal data collected. And then at the bottom part, you would have people who actually don't have an issue with any of their personal data being collected, but those people would then need to be um, educated on what information is being gathered and what that information is going to be used for. So in terms of future work, um, we're looking at the implementation of this framework and the evaluation of this framework and um, exploring things like on-device processing so that the information should not be sent back to the service providers. The biggest um, contribution to this is allowing the data owner full control of their data um, at any point in time using things like um, personal data stores and smart contracts. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, sir, for your presentation. Ma'am, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, as I understand, this is your uh, thesis work, am I right? PhD thesis. Yes, it is. So uh, there, as you said, there will be an interface and you are trying to put a personal data store with the cloud service provider and a part of it will be accessible or given to the user. Am I right? Um, no. So all of the data that gets collected by these smart devices, regardless of the service provider, will then be stored in that user's personal data store. All right. So this personal data store would be at the server side? 
um, it, it will be, it, depending on implementation, it can be on the service side, it can be on the client side. So in this case, this would be something right now, we're looking at implementing it with something along the lines of a uh, Dropbox database or AWS database that is in the control of the um user or or the control of the data owner then each and every service provider will be given access to that information through a smart contractual layer where the smart contract will either say so for argument's sake let's say it is a um your medical insurance wants to know if you've met your weekly step goal. So instead of them having access to your entire smart watch information, uh, where it is your um, heart rate, your, your stress and all of these things, the smart contractual layer could simply just give out a yes or a no to their question of saying, has this person um, completed their number of steps? It would be a yes or a no. If you are comfortable sharing some of the things like your step count, or your heart rate and not everything else, then the smart contractual layer will only expose the data um, points that you are comfortable sharing with a certain service provider. All right, understood. But will it uh, solve the purpose of when you have information on internet and if someone misuses that information, so will the smart contractual layer will help in this? So in that case, if your information is already out there, unfortunately, uh, the solution will not be helpful to you. So the idea behind this is not so another big thing we've we've uh, found out when we're doing our research is that for a disassociation point of view, I know in the US, uh, Google has the forget me, um, uh, forget me, you, you can actually ask them to de-link any of the information they have. But for the rest of the world, it's not so simple. So in most cases, you cancel your subscription with a certain company, but they still keep your personal data. So in this case, because they don't have direct access to that person, personal data only through the interface. And even the interface does not allow them to copy or edit this information. They'll only be have access to certain data points. So from a disassociation point of view, it's in the control of the end user. If I no longer want to be associated to service provider one, I serve at that interface and they no longer have access to my information going forward. All right, good work and all the best for your PhD. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Parakam, are you there to present your paper? Okay, I guess he's not there. So I would like to sincerely thank our authors for their excellent presentation and contributions in this session and all our participants for being the part of this international conference. I hope the session was informative enough for all of you. We, on the behalf of the whole team, thank you for your support during this eighth version and all the previous seven versions of the conference. We will be happy to have you in the ninth version in 2025 as well. All the presenters would be getting their digital certificates through mail within two working days. Further, all the papers have already been forwarded to Sprinter. The publication will be live within six months. Kindly cooperate with the team of World S4 2024. I would also like to thank our session chair, Dr. Preeti Parvekar, for sharing this session. Ma'am, thank you. We were really glad to have you. Would you like to share some quick closing remarks with us? No, no, it was really uh, nice to listen to all the research work and I would like to give them all the best and good luck for their future. And we have shared uh, so many new ideas and I got to know uh, different subjects. Mainly it was on uh, public health and healthcare field. So all the best to all the scholars. That's it. Thank, thank you, you so much, ma'am. I would also like to thank our uh, second session chair, Dr. Thita Pon Gena Kurchana. Thank you so much, ma'am, for chairing this session. Would you like to share a quick closing remark with us? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so uh, I think that the uh, all of the works here are interesting and they have like different aspects of applications. And yeah, I hope to, to see like the further improvement uh, and especially in case of the use case and, you know, the um, real implement, uh, implementation in, in a real world system. Yeah, but anyway, good works and yeah, thank you so much.
Thank you, ma'am. This is a token of appreciation on the behalf of the team of World S4 2024 and Global Knowledge Research Foundations and Partners. So we thank you for your valuable presence. Now I would request everyone to please switch on your cameras for a quick snapshot. Everyone kindly, uh, please, yeah. Are we, are we done? No, no, you can still open your camera. We'll click a picture. Thank you so much, everyone. It was great having you all here. Thank you.